Welcome to another enlightening episode of The Way Up Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Knoll, and today I have the pleasure of sitting down with a dear friend and remarkable individual, Melissa Sharp. Melissa's journey is nothing short of extraordinary. A passionate ultramarathon runner, she has conquered seven 100-mile races and proudly crossed the finish line at the prestigious Boston Marathon three times. Melissa's impact extends far beyond the confines of a race course. She's actively involved in shaping the health and wellness landscape of Pulaski County, coordinating fitness programs in schools, spearheading running events, and cultivating engaged communities through various online platforms like Facebook. Today we have the privilege of diving deep into Melissa's journey, her motivations, and the invaluable lessons she's learned along the way. So sit back, relax, and join us as we explore the intersection of endurance, faith, and community with the incredible Melissa Sharp. The Way Up Podcast is proudly brought to you by my real estate team, the Noble Team EXP Realty. We're redefining industry standards in the markets we operate, distinguishing ourselves from the crowd. We leverage our uniqueness to gain a strategic edge all while elevating not only ourselves, but also those in our world, including our competitors. Join us on this journey. Your time and investment will undoubtedly be well-placed. Hang with us till the end. I know you won't be disappointed. Well, hey, I am super excited to finally get to have you come in my studio. We've talked about doing this. We've been planning to like get together years, and think, our yes. schedules are really difficult. Mm-hmm. You're yeah. you're busy. Mm-hmm. I'm busy, yes. which is a great thing. We're both trying to change the world. I see the things that you're doing, not just in our community, but really all over the place. You travel quite a bit. Mm-hmm. You're, you're involved. You're an ultra marathon runner. You are a representative for... Hoka. Okay. Yeah. What and go go in a little bit. What exactly do you do? I'm gonna let you tell so, these things. So I'm what they call a Hoka flyer. So I'm an ambassador for the company. So my job is basically to do what I would do for free, is just to promote the brand. And you know, as a wellness coach at the health department, and I'm also a certified running coach. I've been coaching running for years, you know, and right. and I've also had the blessing of of having quite a diverse uh, group of experiences from running the Boston marathon three times from, you know, being in the front and then to, and then to going back to the ultra marathons, you know, how to, to seeing how different, you know, the, uh, the, the type of racing and it all comes down to having that right shoe. And I have gone through, you know, so many, so many different types of shoes. And when I discovered that right shoe, you know, it wasn't a coincidence. I saw that they were, um, that they had applications open to be a Hoka flyer to represent the brand. And so, uh, so I applied and this is my seventh or eighth year doing it. And it's, it's been a great platform for me to help others within our community because, um, you know, I, I, you know, we get, we get nurses in the shoes, we get, we get great athletes in the shoes. Now they have a new kids line. So it's, it, it's been just nice because sometimes getting people to the finish line starts with getting them in the right shoe. So mm-hmm. and, yeah, it's been a great fit. It makes a difference having the right, right shoes on when you're running, especially a long distance. Oh, like ab- that. Absolutely. And having the, the the right shoes and you know, you have to know when to have trail shoes, you know, you need to know when there's a lot that goes into getting the proper shoe in it. And it also is, 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 can be indicative. If you're running a 5k, you're going to run a, you know, you might want a racing flat. If you're going to run the longer distances, you might get something with more cushion. And if you're a pronator super, I mean, there's a lot that goes into picking the right shoe. Have you always been a runner? Yes. Mm-hmm. And it's so weird because, um, so my dad was a runner. That's a whole, whole long story, but, um, just kind of thought it was normal. And I've always been a very, you can ask my mom from the time I was little, I've been a very high energy, like from the time out of the womb, I've just been a very high energy person. And she says that she would look out the window and I'd just be running around in the yard for no apparent reason. And, um, so I, I did it recreationally for a long time. And then I had a friend of mine that was diagnosed with brain cancer. Um, when our kids were little, they were actually playing soccer out on the field. Um, I think Luke would have been about seven or eight. And, um, he, the gentleman who was, who was the husband of one of my friends and he, he was also a friend of mine, but he had been exhibiting some very odd behaviors, like cursing at the kids, losing, losing his temper, which was totally uncharacteristic of him, but it was just a normal Saturday. And um, he collapsed on the field and they air backed him out and he had a ganglioma, which is the, is a type of brain cancer that's got like the, like the fish hooks. Mm. So it's very hard to treat. It's a very aggressive form of cancer. And um, the family was just devastated. She was a stay at home mom. 
and he was their sole breadwinner. And so I just saw a need that needed to be filled. I kind of just prayed over it. You know, I, Lord, what can I do to help this family? And up until then, like I said, I was a recreational runner and I just, you know, I'm an outspoken Christian. And so it all comes back to my faith, but um, just felt the Lord say, you know, put together a marathon. This is what I want you to do. And kind of that we did. I'd never run a marathon before in my life. I think my longest distance had been like seven or eight miles. And so we put this together. We called it the Marathon of Hope. we had never done that before, but it would lay the groundwork for probably change the trajectory of my whole life uh, up until that point. And so we did this. We raised about $4,000 for the family, which provided for their immediate needs to where they, you know, they could qualify for assistance, but they got them over that hump just to put food on that ta on their table, you know, and to pay the rent and, and that sort of thing. And I just remember after that race, Jeff, I'm not even joking you. I went home, fell asleep because I was just... I had never, never done a, I'd never done a marathon and they're very, they're very difficult, especially I put together this route that I tell you in a million years, I would never pick the same route because it was so hilly and it was, I, but I didn't know, you don't know right. what you don't know. And when I started doing this, there just wasn't a whole lot of marathons in the area. But that next morning I woke up and I was just like, my goodness, I couldn't tie my shoes. Going to the bathroom took an act of Congress. It was just really bad. And oh, no. trying to make the bed was hard. And I just remember saying, you know, Lord, I am so thankful that I had that experience, but I never want to do that again. I never want to run another marathon. And, it, you know, it wasn't, you know, I felt it on my heart, you know, like, Melissa, you are going to run lots. You're going to run lots of these. And I argued for, for, you know, a couple of months. And then I, um, I ran the, uh, the St. Well, I ran the, um, the Lewis and Clark marathon, which has since been shut down, but hurricane Ike came in that year mm. and it derailed the marathon. They, they, they tried to, well, they put everybody on the buses at mile 13. They had to cut it short. And I should have known that I had the personality of an ultra runner then, because I was like, I'm not getting on the bus. I'm just going to run back to the start line, you know, and count it as a 20 mile tra uh, training run. Cause they were cutting us off at at that mile seven or, or whatever it was it ended up being about 20 miles. And, um, and they said, well, you know, you're welcome to do that. We can't make you get on the buses, but you're not going to have any aid. I was like, oh, that's fine. You know? And I think I, I accrued three other crazies to do it with me. And then looking at a little bit of redemption came back and ran St. Louis that year and qualified for Boston. I, I wasn't even aware of what Boston was at the time. That's how, that's how, you know, naive I was. I just, I just knew I loved to run. And I think I, I came in at 351 and some change and uh, no three, I'm, I'm sorry, 342 because I, because I was, yeah, I was younger then, but anyway, I qualified for Boston and someone said, Hey, do you know, you just qualified for the Boston marathon. So what? And then I was like, Oh, I did. Well, this is kind of exciting. So then I ran my first Boston marathon and that just kind of just changed the whole world of running, you know? And is, then I got into ultra marathons later. Is the atmosphere at the Boston Marathon just like <clears throat> through the roof energy from, oh, from everybody? Absolutely. And, and and I can tell you from, I have a unique perspective of Boston mm -hmm. because I got to run it, run it in 2010 before the bombings, right? Mm -hmm. And I was going to be a one and done. You know, that was it. it, it Boston's very expensive, you know, it just just in, as trip wise. And I had small, small kids. But um, the energy, my sister actually qualified that year right after I did. And then she came from Alaska and we met, we got to run it together. Oh, wow. And it was just, it's one of the greatest experiences you can ever do. It's just so cool and so fun. And they treat you like royalty the next day. But, and then when the bombings happened in 13, um, you know, I, I just, that part of me wanted to go back. And so by the, by God's grace, I qualified, um, I qualified in uh, Nashville and went back in 14 and just got to see the difference between 2010. It was so carefree. I mean, it was just, you know, it was just fun and it was innocent and it was a time of just, it was a time of just a good time in our world, you know, good. It's a great time to be alive. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, so we go back in 14 and then we're, we're having to go through, um, you know, stations and you know we're, we're where we have to go through the radar and we've got snipers up on roofs we've got helicopters flying around you know and it was just it, it was just it it definitely that was a turning point for our world and, and we got to see um some of the runners like they um th that had the prosthetics that were injured that came back and and later on i had the blessing as a race director to attend a race director's conference in kansas city and dave mcgillary which he's the director of the boston marathon he, um, he was one of our speakers and this was, and, you know, being a race director, there's a lot to being a race director that people don't think about. And, you know, I direct 20 different events a year and, and, and some, a lot, lot of small events, but a lot of big events too. But, um, I'll never forget what he said, that he said that he learned that you have to literally be ready for anything as a race director. And he said that they just, they weren't ready. 
you know, how could they have anyone? We've never how, had anything how could like you be prepared that. for something like yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, they just, it came out of nowhere, but you know, running's changed a lot since then. It's, mm -hmm. it's changed a lot. So both good and bad. I think we have a new appreciation for life. I mean, if you really consider how, how um, fleeting life is, you know, the Bible says it's like a vapor here today and gone tomorrow. And there's probably nothing that can teach you that, like being, you know, let's say you were three minutes, you know, out from when the bombings happened or you missed it by 30 seconds. I mean, you just get a new appreciation for life. Sure. Mm -hmm. Did you grow up in this area? Are you from here originally? Yeah. So my dad, uh, my dad was, um, he was in the military Okay. and he was a doctor. And when he got out, he opened up private practice here. So I've been here since, since the third grade, I got married, left and came back and, and I, and I love this area. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. it's awesome. It's, I noticed that there's a lot of probably because the military base is here. There's so yes. many that are fitness minded. Oh yeah. The, the community here, you can go out any given day and find people walking by the Ruby Dew spring. Yes. You can find people out doing things. Whereas some of the places that I've, I've lived, it's hard to find like-minded people that are mm -hmm. wanting to do that, but you have created different groups. Um, you have the FFG donut yes. run that you do mm -hmm. every Saturday. Isn't so, it? so our, 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 our frog fitness group, we do the donut runs the, the third Saturday of every month, third Saturday which is a free 5k, but we meet every, we meet every Saturday morning for fun and fellowship to, to run together as a group. And we, these are totally open to everybody, whether you're a walker or a runner, because the way that we do them, we do them in loops. And so everybody stays together because we're doing a three mile loop and you can turn around at the half mile. You can turn around anytime you want. And we celebrate the smallest, we, we celebrate every small win, every, you know, people come in all sizes, shapes and abilities, right? And so most people, you know, think that that winning is to be on the podium. That is not at all winning. You know, winning is to set out to do what you didn't think you were capable of. Mm -hmm. You know, I teach couch to 5Ks all the time. And I tell you what, the look of joy when some of these people cross the 5K finish line after being told they can't do it or even telling themselves, I can't do this, is more incredible, I'm telling you, than crossing some of these major marathon finish lines. Because, you know, so many people say, well, if I can't run a marathon, I'm not going to run. Well, you know, comparison is the thief of joy. We don't compare ourselves to anybody else because we don't have the same abilities as anybody else. Right. So you do what you can do based on, on, on what your current health is, what you're, what you're capable of doing. And you celebrate those. I think it's a mindset shift that we need to, to, to have when it comes to that. What do you think is, what do you think has made you so passionate about running? in your life. Okay. Well, that, that is very, uh, that's a good question. And I will be totally honest with you. You know, I have suffered from depression my whole life because I am a very type A personality. You know, I have a lot of people that say, Melissa, I wish I had your energy, but having this much energy comes with some downsides too, because it's very hard to shut my mind off. And I'm an overthinker. Um, after the birth of my son, I got diagnosed with PMDD, which is premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which is kind of like my hormones are like, discombobulated as you would say. Okay. And so, uh, they wanted to put me on medicine and I'm very, you know, if you need it, you need it. I'm totally, I, I truly understand that, but I do know that sometimes there's ways to prevent what you, that Avenue to go down different avenues. Mm -hmm. So I just thought, you know, I, I always, I remember Melissa, every time you come back from a run, like you have two or three hours where your mind is, your mind is stilled, your body's stilled and it just feels good. And then I, and then I just thought to myself, what, what if I just run more? And then I, you did, I mean, it doesn't cure it every single time, but it knocks that edge off and I can just, well, it puts my life back into priority, you know, because I can realize what a blessing it is to be out in nature, to be able to smell. And I practice that mindfulness, but it also just reminds me what a gift every day is and that I can make the, I need to make the choice to, if I'm going to get out of that hump, I have to be the one to do it. And so between that, and then I, I quite honestly, I came back, I gave my life to back to the Lord. And every morning I spend in Bible study and then I spend in exercise and that that sets the mood for the whole day. And it's just make me passionate to share that with other people because I see so many people go through life and they just don't feel good. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't feel good mentally or physically, you know, like, um, for instance, you know, I teach, I, I teach good eating habits on top of everything else I teach. Um, and, um, a lot of times, you know, the diet can be such a huge shift, you know, when your body's used to eating or drinking a couple sodas a day and you're getting those sugar highs and those lows and you don't, you don't feel good, but you don't understand why you don't feel good. 
you know, and I've, I've told people, J let's just cut out your sodas for a while, you know, let's do it for a week and they'll come back and go, oh my goodness. I just, I didn't realize the difference. And so I'm very passionate about helping people because, you know, like we come back and I said it before, you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I have experienced a lot of that. I, mm -hmm. I went through soda was, was, I haven't had soda in a few years, but it was something that I drank every day. I, and at first it was hard to, to pass on it. I was like, mm -hmm. man, I, I just so it's an addiction. I was so used to it. Yeah. It was, mm -hmm. it was an addiction, but being away from it, I don't even want it. Like yes. it doesn't even sound appealing to me just because, you know, it's, I I've broken that addiction, which has been super helpful and in, in maintaining energy you Absolutely. get, you get the little sugar spike, mm -hmm. but then there's always a crash to follow that. It's a catch 22. Yeah. It just, it only work, it only works for a little bit. And then you get into some of the other chemicals that you have in it too. And it just, it's just a glass of water goes a lot longer. I think they've actually done studies on that about just chugging a glass of water, what it does to your energy levels versus the caffeine in a soda and water wins every time. That's interesting. Yeah. Water is just, it's, it's just so good for the body. Mm -hmm. So me getting into running, I'm going to talk about me for just a second, but I, I have never associated myself with runners. I growing up, that wasn't part of my life. Uh, sports wasn't a huge piece of, of my school or anything. I was, I was maybe a lazy kid and I didn't want to do anything that was all that physical, mm -hmm. but I, I, I made a bunch of changes and got more active and I just kind of fell into a group of runners here locally just because there's a bunch of them. Yes. There's a bunch of us. And, uh, our friend Jay Teagues, he, mm -hmm. he's in a group of runners. And so I started, I started to get into it. And once I, once I got past the, you know, I'm not dying to breathe, Yes, you yeah. know, and once I got a little bit more in shape with that, I felt like when I'm running, I have, it, it is great for your mental health. Oh, absolutely. It's, um, just being able to one, be in nature. Mm -hmm. I think, I think that is a huge piece huge. of it. Getting the, the vitamin D from the sunlight, getting to be outside mm -hmm. of, you don't have a screen in front of you and feeling like I'm honestly connecting to God. Like, yes. I have some of the deepest thoughts. Absolutely. And I, I feel like I have some breakthroughs. I, I know there was a time whenever I was in my business, I knew that I was coming to a, a turning point. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what the next move was, which those, those come and go on a, on a week to week oh, basis. Sure. You know, you've got, you've got things that you need to figure out what choice is the right thing to do. Whenever I will be like, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to go run and just, I'm, I'm going to focus mm -hmm. and just seek God to see where this goes. Mm -hmm. And those are always the best ones. Yes. Um, I, I never had any desire to do long, long term running. I did a 25 K and I think I decided after that, like you, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to say out loud that I don't want to do that again, because just like you, you're, you're out running hundred mile races. Mm -hmm. How many of those have you done? Uh, I just completed my seventh over Easter weekend, seventh hundred mm -hmm. mile race. I have no desire to do that. This 25 K beat the crap out of my body. Yeah. I was, I was hurting. I'm like, man, my, my whole purpose for running is I want to, I want to be to healthy. Enjoy, yeah. I want to be in shape. I don't want to be hurting. And I see, I see both sides of this coin. Whenever I see people like you that are, you're running around and you, you get banged up from time to oh, time. Oh, absolutely. You oh, get yeah. banged up. You can't, you can't be in the arena and not catch one every once in a oh, while. Oh, that's exactly. It's going to happen. Right. But it's still, it gives you energy. It gives you excitement. It creates the person that everybody knows mm -hmm. that you are just because you're willing to, to get out and keep going back into it over and over and over again. Well, it, it, it just, it absolutely feels good. And, um, it, it's hard to describe why, you know, people like me continue to do these ultra distances and um, call it addiction. I'm sure that's, that's probably part of it. And, you know, when you just, when you have a personality that's so over the top, mm -hmm. I guess, but for me too, it, it just serves as a, 
as a platform, it opens up all these different conversations, right? And and that's always my thing because, you know, it, I, I consider the whole world a missions field, right? And so, you know, the Bible tells us, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, right? Well, if I have a unique ability to go to these, to the ends of the earth per se, I'm going to do it because I always pray over every race that I go to. I don't go unless I'm led to go. And at every race, Larry, my, my, my sweet Larry, he laughs, but I've got a, I've got a whole, um, well, I, they're in a box now, but I've got just all these different medals, right? And he can pull up any one of them. And I can tell him exactly what happened at that race where there was an, in, an intersection with someone that, and we had a conversation or something like that. And so when I go, I never leave, I've never left any race that I was called to do that I didn't come back with a story of meeting someone on the trail that needed to hear a word or needed someone that needed encouragement. I remember one time we were running up in Prairie Spirit and there was um, a girl that we met on the trail. And that's the thing about running too, because you are on an open playing field. It's an even playing field, right? Right? So when you see somebody, you're both in shorts. I don't know what this person does for a living. They don't know what I do for a living. You know, all that we know for this moment in time, we share this piece of suffering that there's something wrong with both of us. You know, if we're out here running a hundred. We both know, Hey, this person's my kind of crazy. Yeah. Right. And so, and even at marathons too, because long, long distances are just, you just, there's a reason why you know, you do, I mean, you're either, I used to say you're running to something for something or from something. And that's generally the case when you start ultra running, you usually have had something happen, you know, it could be divorce, death, you know, whatever it may be, but you, you have the opportunity to meet them at that intersection to be out there. Because when you start a conversation with a runner, you know, it just from being in the run groups, runners are just open. They are just super, super open, but they're even more so when they're out there for a reason and they just feel they can just tell that there's something different about you and you come alongside, you start these chats and they open up. And then I've had people share all kinds of stories with me from, Hey, I'm overcoming a drug addiction. Or I had one lady tell me, you know, I, I, I remember this vividly, you know, Melissa, I've had two abortions is can God forgive me? And these are the open frank conversations we have because they know that they may never see me again, yeah. but for some reason they feel they can open. And that's when I can come and I can say forgiveness is for everyone. It's for everyone who repents. You know, there's no sin that can't be forgiven for the person that says, Lord, I'm sorry. You know, and I, it's, it's just, and, and that's what running is. Running is about more for me than just putting one foot in front of the other. It's being there at that intersection where I'm supposed to be. Well, it's easy to see with mm -hmm. you. I, you have an energy and your, your whole vibe that you put out is very compassionate and people feel comfortable talking to you. Yeah. I, I feel comfortable talking to you. I know we've had running, we've talked through some different things oh, of, yeah. of stuff that, you know, I, I, I told you, I felt like I was, uh, I didn't really fit inside the box of what a Christian should be because mm -hmm. of different things. I was, I was raised, uh, to believe a certain, certain way. And I, I don't, my life doesn't necessarily reflect the way that I was taught that I should believe. Mm -hmm. Yet I feel very connected to God. I feel like, I feel like God leads me where I go and, mm -hmm. and creates these opportunities for making connections with, with yes. all kinds of different people. And I'm, I'm kind of blown away often by the, where conversations go that you would never guess that somebody would open up to you. And I'm, I'm a real estate agent and I'm, I feel like I, I am a counselor sometimes because yes. people are open. I'm like, well, you're, you're telling your real estate agent this yes. wild stuff. It's so crazy, but, but I think people can identify that you're putting out an energy. You're, yes. you are, you're approachable. Yes. They, they, they know, you know, the Bible says that we're supposed to be set apart, right? We're supposed to be so set apart that when we go places and I've had people say, there's something different about you. I can't put my finger on it. You know, they just know. And it's, and, and it's what, what a blessing it is to be used. Right. And I always, and, and, and I'll tell you this, my daughter and I call them a sprite moments. Okay. When you look for God's hand in everything, you will see God's hand in in everything. So, you know, the more that I walk with Christ, the more I'm even in tune to just that still small voice. It says, pull into this gas station, take a left here, do this, do that. Well, my daughter, uh, she was, she was sick one, uh, one, one day and she said, mom, I really, really need a Sprite. And I said, okay, I'm going to run the store. She goes, no, mommy, don't leave me. I want to go with you. And I said, okay. And I, I thought, okay, that's, that's rather odd. So I pull into the gas station and, 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 and then my feelers come up and I'm like, 
okay, this is not a normal intersection. What's going on? So I get out of the car and I'm looking around and I see this lady and she's helping her husband kind of get into the store and he's hunched over and you can tell he's in a lot of pain. And I said, ma'am, are you guys okay? And she says, oh my goodness. She said, and her husband just looked at me and she could, he just had back surgery. She said, he is having the hardest time. Just, I, I just want to get him home, but this car ride is horrific for him. He's in such pain. And I said, well, I, I just, I don't know what to do, but can I pray over him? Can I pray with you guys? And she was like, oh my goodness, would you please? And right there at the gas station, I just laid my hands on him. I said, dear Heavenly Father, you know, we just thank you that before we even came to you with this problem, you already arranged a meeting to show this man that you love him and that you care. And so we, we had our prayer. She thanked me, never saw her again. I get back in the car and Hope goes, hey, where's my Sprite? And I said, oh, I forgot your Sprite. Darn, that's why I'm here. So I go and I get the Sprite and I come back. I said, Hope, do you see what happened here? And she goes, yeah, you're praying with somebody again. I said, it's a sprite moment to make her understand because she was little. I said, sometimes when, when God says, I want you to go to the store, you're thirsty. You're not really going to the store for a sprite. I mean, you are, but you're not. And you right. need to be open to, okay, why, why am I really here? You know, is there, is there someone that needs to, I've had these, these encounters just in Dollar General. I've had them in Walmart. Um, I, I, I remember just, just a couple of days ago, I was coming out of Walmart and, um, there was a lady and she was, she was on, on, on those wheeled carts or those, those power carts. And she was in front of the nicotine gum. And she said, she looked at me and she goes, can you help me? And I was like, oh boy, this is going to be good. I just felt it. And she said, my husband, she goes, I'm going to lose him if he doesn't stop chewing. She goes, which, which nicotine gum do you think I should get? And I said, well, I don't, I'm not really familiar with nicotine gum, but I did have a friend and I did that, that beat the habit with the, with the best choice mint. So I said, I, I think you should give the best choice mint to try. And she goes, thank you. And I handed it to her and she said, boy, I hope this works. And she goes, and I said, well, do you want, do you want to pray over the gum? Do you want, you want to pray for your husband now that his heart is being prepared? She goes, yeah, that's a great idea. And so we prayed and then she said, well, I just, I pray this works. And I said, ma'am, with all due respect, we just prayed. And I, and I, and I hope that you expect that prayer to be answered. And she goes, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. But it's just those little moments in time that if you miss them, you miss them and you may not get that chance again. Yeah. When you're looking for opportunities, they're always there. They're everywhere. And if you are so focused on what you have going on in your, mm -hmm. in your small vision of your world, you're going to miss all kinds of things. Yeah. That's why you, it's, it's good not to be in a hurry. So slow down a little bit. Tell me something that most people that know you may not know about you. Oh my goodness. There's there, there probably I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a hot mess. Are you? Yes. Um, and, and, and I have the reason that I am the way that I am is because I've had a lot, a lot of trials in my life. I've had a lot of setbacks. I've had a lot of suffering and I've had, there's just been a lot. And, um, I never in my life would have thought until I, and, until I grew older and looking back, James one verses two and three says to consider it pure joy when you encounter uh, trials of various kinds, because that, you know, that the testing of your faith provides perseverance and perseverance must finish its work. So you can be mature and lacking in nothing. Right. And so I've heard the scripture all my life. And I've always thought, up, up until when I, when I went hundred percent in with God, Lord, I don't understand this. I don't understand suffering. I don't understand it. And then the more that it happened, and then we see the, the promise of Romans 8, 28, that God works all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. When we see, and we're patient and we wait for God to, because we want everything to be in our time. We want God to redeem our pain right then and there. We want to know why am I suffering, right? That's what all mankind wants to know. Why am I going through this? Lord, if I'm a faithful believer, why am I going through this? And sometimes we have to learn, remember his ways are higher than ours. And it's not up to us to know. We just have to trust the process. So there's been prayers of, I mean, there's been suffering that's decades old that when it came to fruition, I look back and I say, okay, Lord, I see, I see. So you, for instance, you know, I do the aqua running, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. This in itself. Okay. If, if anybody out there is listening and they don't understand what aqua running is. So it's basically you strap on an aqua jogger belt, you go through the motions of running in the water. And so I have, you know, like if you have a bulging, bulging disc, if you're coming back after knee replacement, if you're an injured athlete or whatever, this is the best way it's a good to, low impact yeah, to go, but, but to keep your endurance up. So a lot of right. athletes will use this when they're, uh, when they're recovering. 
many years ago, right before, uh, right before my second Boston marathon. Okay. I came down with perineal tendon. No, it was before it, 2016, before my, my, uh, before that one. Um, so in 2015, I came down with perineal tendonitis. It's just a weird type of tendonitis. It's the, it's the perineal nerve that runs on the side of the leg. And it's absolutely, it's absolutely excruciating. You cannot run with perineal tendonitis. It's about as bad as, as Achilles tendonitis. So I'm six weeks out from Boston. Right. And I'm like, okay, I've already got my tickets. Everything else is done. You know, um, what am I going to do? I'm six weeks out. And I know as a running coach, you lose all endurance in three weeks. So even if I'm able to, I'm healed in six weeks, all of my endurance is going to be you gone. You lose all endurance in three, weeks. in three weeks. That's basically the standard. I mean, you gain a little bit, you know, here, but for the most part, mm. three weeks is pretty much it. You know, you've got a pretty, pretty, three weeks is when you you lose the majority of it. Let's, let's put it that way. So I'm, I'm praying, I'm frantic. And I'm like, Lord, I don't understand this. How many people say that, right? How many of us Christians have said, Lord, I don't understand this. Yeah. And once again, we will learn later. It's going to take a while right. to learn. And so, um, by the grace of God, I had some friends of mine that would step up and say, Hey, one was Jackie Chen. She's a retired podiatrist. And she said, Melissa, but I'm going to, I'm going to put you in a boot. I want you to go in a boot. And uh, she goes, that tendon will heal in six weeks, 99% chance you're not going to burst it. She said, however, she said, you got to find another way to train. And she said, um, you're going to be in tremendous pain because you're not going to have done any pounding because the way you train, you're going to have to find something that you can do that doesn't involve the pounding and, and hitting the pavement. So another friend told me about aqua running. And so I, I bought the aqua jogger belt and I did to simulate the longest training runs, you have to go a little bit further in the pool. So let's say a, a 20 mile training run back in the day would have taken me two, two and a half hours. Um, I'm going to have to be in the pool for four hours. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing three and four and, and I may not have my math totally correct, but I did do three and four hour pool sessions in the pool. And this is before, you know, the, you know, I was able to get on YouTube and do the cordless headphones and watch things. So I would just turn on the radio and, and put it right by the pool and do three and four hour sessions by myself, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth in this pool by myself. And, and I questioned God. I'm like, Lord, I don't understand this. Why am I in this pool? I'm the leader of a running group. I'm, we have a running ministry and I, and I can't run. And don't you know, I'm supposed to go to Boston. I don't understand why is this happening? Right. So we, so we go through this whole thing. Well, little did I know this was building up some massive grit, grit that I was going to need later when I was called to do the hundred milers grit that, you know, this was a mental, um, strength that I couldn't have gained any other way because I'm by myself. And what happens in ultra marathons? You're by yourself because once they break off and the 50 Kers finish and the 50 milers finish, well, you got about a lot of not many people out there finish in the hundred miler. And, and it's the same with marathons because you'll all start off together. And then pretty soon the half marathoners will veer off and you're in no man's land again. So that mental grid is absolutely crucial when, when, when you're, when you're in the ultra running community. But, um, my son, Luke had graduated, he was graduating from high school that year and it was going to be his last hurrah. We were going to, we we're going to do it together. So, um, I was able to, to do all this training. I still have the boot on. We get on the plane. Luke's with me and he goes, mom, do you have a game plan? I said, not really. I said, I'm just praying when we take off this boot, I'm, I'm able to run. That, that's all I know. And I didn't know anything further than that. We get up the next morning and I, ha you have to get, um, we have to get to, to the buses and they take you to athletes village. And that's where you wait out your time because Boston's down in waves with the, with the fastest ones going in wave one, wave two, wave three. So I was going to be wave three, which is going to take a while. So we're in athletes village. And unfortunately, this is where my mind starts to go. I'd given Luke my boot that morning. And I said, bring this to the finish line because I'm going to put it back on. Immediately, I started limping because I wasn't used to not having the boot on. So my gait was totally off, absolutely off. And I'm like, oh gosh, this is not a good way to start a race. I've already got one strike against me. Then I'm getting ready in Athletes Village and I'm like, okay, I've got my tunes. I'm just going to put them on. My, uh, my, my, my headphones do not work. I'm like, okay, I just checked these. I don't know what's going on. They never did work the whole time. Third strike, I'm out there and I got my mind and I'm thinking, okay, how are you going to get 26.2 miles when you are limping even to go to the porta potty. How's this going to work? And I'm like, Lord, I don't understand this, but I'm going to have to trust you. I'm trusting you. We're walking up, they call our wave. And this girl behind me, behind me, she says, how far do you think you're going to get like that? Just really snotty. And I was like, okay, all right. 
all right, I see, I see what's happening here. Then I was even more determined, but I start running and it was pretty evident from the start that this, this was going to be, um, this was going to be a grind. It was not going to be pretty because I was, I was hop skipping, hop skipping, hop skipping. Cause I was used to having a boot on my body was not used to not having that. So I was running like I had, I had it on and, um, Boston has a strict six hour cutoff mm. and I qualified with a three thirty eight, and now I'm just trying to get six hours. Right. Right. So that was quite the, 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 the humbling experience to say, to, to say the least, but I'm about at mile 17. And I'm like, Lord, I cannot do this anymore out of the blue. Here comes this guy from Japan. And we stayed in contact. I, um, I, 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 uh, forgot what his real name is, but he told me to call him Danny because his, his his Japanese name was too hard to, it yeah, it, it, it was too hard to do, but he goes, he goes, you know, do you know, and he, he said it in his accent and I can't quite do it, but he said, do you know, do you know why you're unhappy? And he must've known. I was like, no. And I was like, how did he know I was not happy? He goes, because he goes, your mind, your mind, your mind thinks you're walking. He said, pick it up to shopping pace. Let's do my wife's shopping pace. He goes, you, you're injured. I'm injured too. He said, come on, we're going to pick it up to shopping pace. So I, everything that I could muster, I picked it up to this like shopping pace. And he goes, yeah, your mind's happy now, isn't it? And I was like, well, yeah, my mind's kind of happy. And he goes, come on, we're going to finish this. And so we just had the most wonderful conversation. We talked about life in Japan. We talked about life in the United States. We just, we talked about our kids. We talked about what we did for a living. Just a great conversation. We crossed the finish line. And I said, you know, you are an answer to prayer. I, I just want to thank you for that. And he goes, you know what? I'm a believer too. And we hugged. He went to his wife. I waved and I went to go see Luke. Luke gave me the boot and I put it back on. And Luke, you know, that kid couldn't have been more inspired if, if I had won the Boston Marathon because he had just seen his mom do something that was totally, totally radical because that morning I said, Luke, I don't think I can do this, but I'm going to give it my best shot. I said, I'm going to step up to the start line and, and I'm, and I'm going to give it my best shot. And I know he was like, mom, you can do it. He was rooting for me. Right. And what a great scene for a, you know, a 17 year old kid you know, that's graduating high school to see, you know, it's one thing as a parent to say, always try your best. Even if you're going to fail, get out there. You at least got to try. You got to give it that try. But he saw it. Yeah. He saw an action. And later on, he went to the military, became a warrant officer. And he said it was just something that he, he eventually, he, he paced my first hundred. He, he said that was just an experience. He, he ran his first marathon and he said that he, he had never, you know, that was an experience that he was like, wow. Yeah. You can do hard things if you really, you know, if you really set your mind to it. That's incredible. Yeah. Incredible that your son got to witness that. Oh, he, he is. You were probably Superman for, for a solid, good long time after, I after witnessing. That. I, I, I might've gotten a little respect out of that. It's hard Heck, to get respect yeah. out of a teenager. Might've gotten a tad bit. Yeah. Yeah. But he, uh, he, he, he's going on to do great things. And then he, uh, he did a marathon and then he paced my first hundred miler. And, um, that's, that's a topic for a whole story for a whole nother story, but I can give you the nuts and bolts of, if you want to hear it real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Luke left me with something that I left him with something that day, but he left me with something. So I was, I was, oh my goodness. I was on fire. My training was great. This was, I, I, I DNF'd in 2014. So this was my second attempt at a hundred miler. I came back in 2017 and man, to say I was running well would be an understatement. I was really clipping along good. Cause you know, you have your slow twitch muscle fibers and your fast twitch muscle fibers. And so I was coming off a 2016 Boston marathon. So I was still fast. And so my ultra training hadn't slowed me down yet. So I was kind of at a crossroads. So I was still particularly fast for an ultra runner. So at, at the rate I was going, I, I, could, if I could have sustained the pace, I would have come in about 21, 22 hours, which is, is pretty, is pretty fast for a hundred miler, but, um, running along good mentally great. It was just a great experience running the, the best I'd ever had in a somewhere be before mile 70, the wheels just fell off. It's like someone had kicked me off a horse. The wheels just fell off. And Luke was supposed to pace me the last 25 miles. And he's like, mom, I'm going to come in a pace you now. We had 31 miles to go. I said, Luke, I don't think you can. He said, mom, I'm, I'm going to pace you. I said, I, I just don't, I don't know if I can go on. And he's like, mom, you're going to get in there. You're going to get in the aid station. You're going to get some coffee and you're going to get some bacon and we're going to go. He goes, you keep telling me I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Come on, you're going to do this. 
later came to find out too, I was had my feet were on fire, absolutely on fire from my knees down. I was wearing compression socks. Didn't find out till three, three other ultra ultras later that I was allergic to the nylon and compression socks. So my, my feet were actually burning. I ended up peeling several layers of skin. Oh so goodness. they were, so it felt like a blowtorch every time I would step, but I still had 31 miles to go. Right. And so I, it, it, you know, had, had I known, I, I, of course, the sock issue was huge, but it literally felt like a blowtorch every time I stepped. And I just, I, I couldn't hardly move. And, and, and Luke said, mom, I'm going to do this with you. We're going to do it together. And when I thought that I couldn't go another step, he and I walked 10 hours through the night and had the most amazing conversations and just talked about everything. And he was trying to take my mind off the pain. But I remember he told me something, you know, when we set out there, I said, Luke, my feet hurt. He goes, mom, listen, Listen, mom, he said, tomorrow's going to come either way. The sun's going to come up either way. And you're either going to have given up or you're going to finish. You're going to be a finisher. And he said, regret makes a very hard pillow. And I don't know where that 17 year old kid or might have been. No, he was 18 at the time where he got that. But I thought, oh, my gosh, he's so right. And I just made that decision. Melissa, just keep stepping. The sun's going to come up tomorrow. Just like he said, either way, you're either going to have that buckle or you're not. So I finished sub 24, barely sub 24, which is like the Super Bowl of, of hundred milers. And he ended up laying down about two miles before the finish line and they had to come get him because he just couldn't, he couldn't go anymore. And um, I woke up that next day and I, I got up and I was going to go to the restroom and I, and I stepped down and I was just, and there was a blister. I'm not kidding you probably this big on the mm -hmm. bottom and it was huge, but it was the best walk I ever had because every time it I, it made this noise, I'm like, that blister is going to go away. But the regret of not finishing would be with me forever. And so I always remembered that, Melissa, you, if you would have stopped, you would have regretted it your whole life. Right. You know, this are just some flesh wounds here. This is going to heal. This is all going to get better. And I've never forgotten that about regret makes a hard pillow. So just do the hard thing instead. How much wisdom from a... 18 year old oh. kid. Holy crap. That's, I know. I think that's some good parenting though. Well, I'd like to, to think so. To create I, I appreciate that. In that, that that's yeah. some good parenting. I'm, yeah. I'm really impressed by that. And he's a good kid and he pushed me and he pushed me. How, how old is he now? He is 20, let's see, 90. He'll be 25 this year. 25. 26, excuse me. And he flies Black Hawk helicopters for the, uh, for the air, uh, not the air force for the national guard. Super oh, proud cool. of him. He's a very gritty kid. Yeah. Very gritty, very resilient, very in it. And where's, where's he at? He lives in Kansas city right now. Lives in Kansas mm -hmm. city. Awesome. I just saw him last weekend. They had a great, had a great time with them. He's, he's about as crazy as his mom, but um, he's, he's definitely, he's, he, he's my pride and joy. And then I have hope and she's, uh, she'll be 19 this year and she's, she's a gem as well. Knowing you for the amount of time that I've known you, I have a feeling I know the answer to this question, but what if you had to pick one thing that you can identify that really sets you up for success in your life, what would you say that would be? Mm. That's a very good question. I, I would probably say um, just I, I seem to have been born with um, with uh, the passion to never give up. Like it's just it's it seemed to be ingrained in me from a young child that I just, I, I, I just refuse to give up on anything. And, um, yeah, that's, that, uh, that's a really hard, hard question to answer. And I, and I will say that, that a lot of the things that I went through in childhood gave me the grit to, uh, gave me the grit that I have today. And, and obviously my, my relationship with Christ, because I view things from a whole nother, I view things from a, from an eternal lens rather than just from a temporal lens, you know, because I know that, that this life is so fleeting and that I don't have much time and I want to make an impact on everyone that I can before, you know, now whether, and like I said, again, I just know that, you know, these, the pain's going to be temporary, the injuries are going to heal, but I only have this one moment in time to get out there and leave a, leave a legacy, not for me, but a legacy of faith. I want, when I die, I want people to say, man, she sure loved the Lord. I don't, I don't I sure think anybody God. that's ever met you is going to have any question or doubt in their mind <laughs> about you loving God. I, yeah. I don't, I don't see that because you're so you're loud and proud. Yeah, I, you are. I, I am. I'm very you unapologetic. Are, are unapologetic and, and, and I speak out of love. You do. I do. You do. You're not condemning people. Mm -mm. 
No, because I'm 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 as, as much as a as a filthy sinner as anybody else. I'm saved by grace, but I need that grace every day. I sin every day, just like everybody else, you know. I and I and I realize that I'm no better than anybody else. You know, it's I'm one choice away. You know, we're all one bad decision away from going down the road of drug addiction or, you know adultery or, or whatever, because we're all faced with temptation each and every day. And it's when we remember that, you know, because, you know, uh, Jesus told Peter, you know, Peter said to Jesus, he said, you know, everyone else is going to, they may abandon you, but I, but I never will. And Jesus said, before the rooster crows, you will, you will have denied me three times, you know, and that's such a reminder that, you know, even in your Christian walk, you've got to be careful each and every day. You've got to, you've got to pay attention to what's going around, around you. You've got to be discerning and we, and, and there's no room to be judgmental of anybody because we all face the same temptations. Right. Mm -hmm. I want to circle back to another thing that we talked about too. You, you mentioned going through the things, preparing us for, mm -hmm. for what is coming or, or what's ahead of us. Do you ever just think about, um, do you, I'm trying to think of how to phrase that. Do you think about this being grateful for the struggles and the challenges Every that you've gone one. through? Absolutely. Absolutely. I know whenever I'm, I'm meditating, mm -hmm. that is the thing that co I come back to over and over mm -hmm. and over again. I'm sitting in, in calm, quiet, I'm out outside in nature. And I, I think about all of the struggles and the challenges yes. that sucked a whole lot going through that. Absolutely. And I remember feeling like, what have I done wrong? I've, yeah. I had to have done something I wrong to be that. in this situation, but it's not even that it's, it's just, this is what you need. So you can mm -hmm. have this perspective so you can come out and you can actually help somebody see the positive side of, mm -hmm. of the things that they go through because everybody goes through stuff Absolutely. and we feel isolated mm -hmm. and alone whenever we're doing it. But, but the, the thing is everybody has challenge and everybody has struggle and we our our life experience is probably not that different. Absolutely. I, I think if we look at it from, from this point of view, because the Bible tells us that God is our, is our wonderful counselor, right? Well, counselor is also coach. This is what he does, right? So when you write a training plan, a coach knows the athlete, but God knows us even more so because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. He knit us together in our mother's womb. God knows everything about us. He knows absolutely what we need. He knows how long we need to be in the fire. He knows what things we, we need to go through. And the Bible tells us that no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but afterwards provides a harvest of righteousness by those for those who have been trained by it, right? So this discipline, every coach knows that an athlete has to develop discipline, right? That is the main, that is the core ingredient, because if you have all the talent in the world, if you have all the faith in the world, you're not going to go anywhere unless you're disciplined to use it, right? And so we have to remember that God is our coach. So he personally allows us to go through these trials and these struggles. And now a lot of them, they're, they're brought on by us. You For know, sure. there's a lot of them I did myself because I made poor choices. I made wrong decisions. I went when he said, stop. I, you know, this, I, I made poor life choices, but at the end of the day, it's, he uses everything for our good and for his glory and he brings it back and can use it. But the specific trials that he allows us to go through that are perfectly tailored for us, they're not pleasant at the time and they're not meant to be pleasant hmm. because no athlete grows in comfortability. You don't grow unless your muscles are stressed. We don't, we don't grow unless we go through that, but it's, it's very unpleasant at the time. But in knowing that it provides a harvest of righteousness, I mean, that's huge. Like we get more like Christ each and every time we go through these disciplines and we get stronger in our minds, we get stronger in our hearts. And all of that goes down into, for, for the runner, it, it goes down into the legs because you get this, you get this grit, you get a spiritual grit, a mental grit, a physical grit, and, and the Lord knows that we need this. And I think if, if, if we just realize that, hey, he's our coach, he's not going to put us through any training that's not going to be valuable. Every training is going to be specific. Like when I write training programs for people, I take into life their, who they are, what they're capable of, what they're going through at the time, you know, just everything about them. And then I specifically tailor a training plan to that, what their goal is, what they want to do. And they'll tell you parts of their training plan are awful and they don't like me 
for parts of their training plan. But if they want to get to that ultimate goal, which every believer should be being like Christ, then we have to look at the whole training plan as a whole and say, okay, oh, Monday's going to be great. Oh, Monday's rest day. Woohoo. Oh, no, Thursday, long day. Friday, sprints at the track. Oh, oh, but Sunday's rest day. You know, but if, but we're not privy to know. Okay. The whole, we don't have the whole training plan. We don't have the whole training plan. We have that segment. We have whatever God chooses to reveal to us at that time. But if we remember and we keep that eternal lens and we keep eternity in mind, then it's easy for us to go to the day through the day today. And for that person out there that's saying, Melissa, I'm hearing you, but I'm still not, I'm still not quite there. This is what you got to do. You got to relearn to trust your coach, go back, play back the film, Right. Play back the film and remember, what did he do with this trial? What did he do with this trial? And remember, the same God that was the same yesterday is the same today and forever. And he will take, he he has a track record, excuse all the puns. Mm -hmm. He has a track record of, of always working things for good. And sometimes that takes a while. Yeah. Sometimes it takes decades. And I can tell you that from experience. And sometimes it happens in a matter of hours. But since we don't know, we have to trust the coach and put our lives into his hands. And let him write the program. You're a hundred percent right. Mm -hmm. I've, I have, since I've started being mindful of, you know, thanking God for the struggles that I've gone through mm -hmm. as I come into new ones, which happen frequently, um, I, I, I can see it. I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, I'm not going to stress about this. I know that it's going to work out. Yeah. It sucks right now. I'm mm -hmm. not, I'm not loving the moment. <laughs> But I'm grateful for what I'm going to learn, mm -hmm. you know, because there's always something. Always. What is this preparing me for? Mm -hmm. What am I going to, what impact am I going to be able to make on other people mm -hmm. because of this challenge that I'm facing right mm -hmm. now? So that's super powerful. Melissa, you are so inspiring. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm very grateful for our friendship. I'm grateful that we met. And I know that that was by no accident no. whatsoever, but I am so happy to live in a community with you where you are out and you're spreading joy and you're, you're the joy filled runner. This is yes. what, this is what people know of. And I, I don't know, is there, is there a book in the works? There should be. I've had a lot of people ask me that. Um, I do do, um, I do do a blog, you do the joy filled runner dot blogspot.com. And then I have a YouTube channel where I do little short little videos. I, I just wanted to tell you day, before we got away from each other. That, I want to do it. I, I've heard the, the I thing. think there's a book right in here, right here. There's yeah. a book from, from you, from your experience. And I would totally encourage, I, I want to see it. I want to read it. I want to, I want to be part of, of getting that out of, you, you know what you, um, that's been on my heart for some time. And so for you to say that, I think, okay, peeps, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna start writing one. Yeah. I think it's a, because, you know, um, I, I just want to be an inspiration to everybody. And like I said, you know, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. We're not guaranteed the next hour. Right. We're not guaranteed the next day. And I tell you what, some of the the things that that I've I've been able to go through and come out the other side. And I don't say I'm a survivor. I say I'm a thriver, because when God takes you through something, you know, you you can totally totally be um, for, for a new creation for one thing, but that you you can take that victimhood you know, that the devil wants us to carry around with us our whole lives. And you can set that on fire and say, not through Christ, not through Christ. I am more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. And to show people that, hey, because we look at people all the time, Jeff, we do it all the time. We look at people and we think, man, she's got it all together. I've had people come oh, I, and I'm like, I think oh, that about all kinds of people. I'm, I'm like, like, let me tell you, great if I had my life together, like oh. they do. Or like, you know, your life must have always been great. You know, look at your pictures. I'm like, uh, no, you would not believe some of the trials I've gone through. So if I can tell you, hey, I have been through this fire and this fire and this fire, and I came out the other side, I smelled like smoke, Woo! but I came out the other side and that's the important thing. And I came out happy and joyful. And I looked back and people will say, you know, hey, would you change your experience? Would you change this? Would you change that? No way, no way, not one shred of it. That's powerful. Yep. Well, thank you for coming on. Thank you so much. I greatly appreciate you, and, you and keep up the good work. Thanks.
yeah, boy.